Oh, hello. Welcome back to Radio Rental. Hey, listen, I'll greet you properly in a minute, but I'm, I'm just in the middle of some surgery here, as you can see. <clears throat> Pass me the instrument, will you, Malachi? No, no, the forceps. <clears throat> Don't worry, I'm sterile. Double entendre. Now, I have to extract the Adam's apple. Easy does it, easy does it. Here we go. Oh, damn it. I was so close. Oh. Oh, look at Malachi over there gloating. He's very competitive and bizarrely good at the board game operation, despite his lack of opposable thumbs. Now, would you like to take a shot at it, dear listener? No. You probably want to watch another one of my scary VHS tapes from my secret stash, huh? <laughs> I've got you quite addicted, haven't I? Oh, I have excellent taste, if I do say so myself. Oh, and by the way, in case you are somehow new here, I'm your host, Terry Carnation. I mean, I don't know why on earth you would start randomly on this episode. Go back to the beginning, like a normal binge listener. Anyway, the tapes. <clears throat> oh, how about this one? Let's see if this does you right. The year was either 2018, 2019. Was living in southwest Washington near the Vancouver area. Happily married with a single teenage daughter and two German shepherds and a bangle. It was during the summer months, early summer, June, July, I want to say, we decided we wanted to go camping. Anytime we go camping, because of the dogs, because of how high energy they are, and it can be intimidating for folks, we usually find remote, non-local areas, off-site, off the beaten trail, off Forest Service roads, primitive sites that we go explore, and, and then we kind of make our home for the weekend. And this one was no different. It was just going to be a, a weekend trip, do some four-wheeling, do some hiking out in the Mount Jefferson area. I usually do all the work up front. I'm the one that does all the getting all the food and directions prepped. I typically pull out Google Maps and I say, all right, what time of year are we in? Oh, it's, it's early summer. Okay, the snowpack should be dialing it back and there's gonna be good access to some of the mountain peaks. I like, found an area near Mount Jefferson. I said, hey, this looks like it's in the middle of nowhere. Told my wife that, hey, take that Friday off. Sure enough, she did. So we usually leave early in the morning seven, eight in the morning to beat traffic. Threw things back the foreigner and the dogs, and we only had two dogs at the time. Once I get there, it's kind of just explore mode. Where's a safe place? Where's kind of a nice, where we could set up a campsite? It's kind of just feeling it out. I find the most perfect campsite. It's this horseshoe off of this old forest service road. Immediately set up camp. I usually always bring a backup tent just for whatever reason if I want to go do something and for whatever reason gives me peace of mind. And that particular trip, my daughter wanted to know if she could uh, spend the night by herself. I said that was no problem. I had the backup tent. We set up the two tents next to each other and I just said, yeah, if you're going to sleep in the backup tent, you're going to have to have Guts, who was our male German Shepherd. It's about a four hour drive by the time you're doing all that exploring and everything. So we were probably set up till around one o'clock. It's just getting set up. You know, maybe we played some games, some bocce balls, some catch or something like that. At night, for folks that aren't used to it, it can sound creepy or eerie, but you know, I really enjoy it. You're gonna hear an owl, you're gonna hear squirrels moving through the grass. Occasionally you may hear some frogs, some crickets. Deer coming to the campground, you know, many times deer come to the campground and pick up scraps of litter or things that you may have missed that fell off. You'll hear that I've had elk and deer rub against the tent. That particular first night we were there, I and my wife kept hearing these really heavy footsteps. Both my wife and I were, just, were like, do you hear that? And it felt like it was just encirculating us. My measure of alarm is looking at the dogs, and my dogs peek their heads up every once in a while, and I saw them looking outside the tent, but they didn't bark. And so I said, okay, well, whatever is out there, I'm gonna attribute to maybe a bigger buck or something. It's just, it didn't sound like what I was used to for hearing deer and, and elk. That first night, it was uneasy, which is unusual when we're camping. I usually sleep fine, I sleep like a baby. 
I just had this feeling like it's just, the footsteps don't sound right. Next morning, we get up. I look around, nothing's awry, nothing's amiss. So I said, okay, great. Let's go on a hike. Get our gear together, just, you know, day pack. And I always carry with me when I'm camping out in the woods for a variety of reasons. We start hiking probably about a half a mile down the road. All of a sudden, my dog, Gut, just takes off. He sprints at something and sprints so quickly, by the time I turn, he's already 40 feet down this trail and I see that it's an old gate post. So it used to be a turnoff point, but it had been so covered in foliage, you missed it at first. You know, it has been basically non-maintained for probably 50, 60 years. So I thought, okay, this probably was an old road that somebody was camping on, which, you know, some people live out in the woods, you know, it's just whatever. I start running after him, yelling at him, saying, hey, gut, stop. And I start apologizing, thinking, oh, he's clearly stumbled on another campsite. He's going to scare these poor folks to death. He's going to get himself hurt, whatever. I'm yelling after him, and I had probably run about 100 feet in. By that time, I was enough around the corner that I could see something didn't look right because I could see this blue object. It was an unnatural blue, so I knew it was something man-made. I was like, okay, that's gotta be somebody, somebody's gear, but in you looking down this road, and it doesn't look like it's been traveling in a, in a while, and uh, nobody's saying anything. Another 50, 70 feet, I'm around the bend, and sure enough, it's a whole abandoned campsite. All the hallmarks of a fully prepped campsite. It had a tent, it had a cooler, it had a propane tank, it had one of those camp burners, stove burners that you hook the propane tank up to. And the thing is, some of the stuff was really nice. And I thought to myself, who would leave all this gear here? Why would someone just throw all this stuff, this expensive camping gear away? It had all been destroyed. It's like, okay, this is so weird to me because where we are, of course, there could be a lot of snow, but there's so much tree density in here. I was looking around like, could there really that much snowpack come in where we are right here with this much tree cover to crush this stuff? I couldn't make sense of why everything could be that damaged. We circle around. I think we saw magazines or newspaper clippings too that were also ripped up. But that was it. Just a fully abandoned campsite. It weirded us out. Nobody was there. We didn't see any cars. We just kind of said, all right, this is very strange. Let's walk back. And sure enough, we walked back to the road and continued on our hike for a little bit. I'm thinking about it. I can't get my head around it, but I don't want to spoil the day. You know, gosh, I got Grace and the wife with me. I don't want to be spooking them. We go up to the top of a hill, and I hear another weird noise. This time, it sounded like grunting. I don't think there's moose in this area. I'm highly unlikely, but there's definitely elk, definitely buck, and definitely black bear. Where the noise is coming from and where the wind is blowing, three sweaty humans and two dogs a lot of scent for an animal to pick up, and that wind is carrying it over to that direction, and it didn't deter it. It's probably some elk or shedding or something like that, and it's got, you know, didn't think too much of it. Go back to our campsite, have dinner, start playing bocce ball. And as I'm playing bocce ball, the dogs are right by my side, as, you, as would normally be the case. All of a sudden, I see Jamie walking up, guts within a few seconds later, gets up and he just sprints. His ears are back, his head is down, his back fur is up. He is dead-eyed set, focused in on her. I mean, he is bullseyeing her. I was like, wait, what? what's going on? What did I miss? Because his tail wasn't wagging. He was, wasn't wagging, he wasn't jogging. He, he was clearly trying to get to her as fast as he could. That struck me as odd. So I kind of like look around and I see he's, yep, he's running right at her. So I start running towards her. As I start running towards her, all of a sudden I see Jamie starting to run towards us. My wife is running towards me and Guts. I was like, oh my God. So I immediately just like out of instinct, I grab my pistol. She runs at me, Guts just keeps going. He's running so fast, I can't, there's no, there was no way I'm gonna catch him. He continues, I'm like uh, struggling. I'm like, what's going on? What's happening? She's like, I've had eyes on me. Someone was watching me. Someone was watching me. I felt eyes on me. Guts continues on. I finally am screaming at him and he finally stops. He's probably 100 feet, 150 feet ahead of me in the thicket of the woods. 
Leia and my daughter are behind me by about 30 feet. Leia was right next to my daughter, right at her hip. All of her hair was raised. She would not leave her side. And then I was like, okay, clearly she senses something is wrong because she's not thinking this is a game. She's not interested in what Guts is interested in. Maybe she's being alerted to what me and my wife are responding to. She was behaving very oddly and she was just glued to her. Finally, Guts returned and he came back and we scoured the area. We didn't see anything, you know, and I did a, would like to think, a, a pretty thorough job of surveying what possibly could have my wife saw or sensed and what caught Guts' eye. I would tell my daughter everything's going to be fine. He'll go in, go back to the tent. She's ahead of us walking back, and my wife and I are basically whispering. I'm like, so what happened? And she just keeps repeating the same thing. She's like, I know someone's watching me. I swear I saw someone watching me. I said, okay, well, there's clearly nothing out here, so what do you want to do? At this time, it was dust. I mean, there was some sunlight left. We were so in the boons that by the time we packed up, it was going to be pitch black. And then trying to drive on one of these back road forest service roads that aren't maintained. If you don't know what you're doing, you can't see well. You, know, you can just as easily catch something, fall into something, and cause a whole nother level of pain. So I said, okay, well, let's just bring my daughter into the tent tonight. So we'll all sleep together. Maybe what it will do is I'll just set up a little tripwire. I happen to have 100 feet of paracord with me. So I took that around, started tying as elementary as I could of a perimeter cable around our campsite. And I just hung an Altoids can and the truck keys, and I think I put some change and a lighter and the Altoids can. And so it gave a jingle when, you, you know, when the wire was tensioned. As I go to tie the last strand where I was gonna close off the sort of perimeter tie, that's when all of a sudden, like, my entire heart just fell out of my body. I'm staring at this tree. I'm holding this, these ropes in my hand, and I'm looking down, and I see that someone had done the same exact thing that I had done. There was a brown cable there that had washers on it. The rope was so old that I never, no one saw it. I mean, it was so dilapidated and decayed and dirty from the dirt. You was no way of seeing it, and it was all fragmented. There was only a few inches hanging off the tree in various places, but the washers were still on there. They had it about the same exact height I was about to tie it. Someone had the same exact feeling at this exact campsite that I'm having right now that they needed to do this. This is an unusual and unnerving experience. And my gut was telling me, okay, I gotta stay calm in front of them, but I'm pretty terrified, so what can I do? Probably not the best, but my solution was, I'm gonna fire my pistol, and I unloaded a clip into the ground. If somebody is out there, at least they know that we are armed, and now they also know we have dogs. That night, not one else to sleep, obviously. 5 a.m., 6 a.m., the second the sun's up, packing up and immediately leaving. I tell some of my coworkers, and they're all telling me I got to call the ranger station and report the campsite and all that. And part of me gets hesitant at first, me admitting to myself that it really was potentially a situation where somebody was at risk previously, and, and then us then, it made it very real. So it did take me a while to eventually call the, the ranger station and report that location. For a few months, you know, it was all good. I'm watching this documentary. It was about missing people, and it plots the number of missing people basically in a GIS, geospatial map. All of a sudden, it pops up Oregon. The biggest, highest concentration of missing people is smack dab. 100% right over that area we were camping. I yelled and paused the screen and told my wife to come look at the TV. I think I took photos of it and sent it to my dad and my mom. I mean, I was flipping out. I could only have so much cognitive dissonance for so long and tell myself that it was an elk. Somebody was being lazy and then left all the crap there, you know. I can only do that so far. And then eventually, no matter what, you have to face the reality like, nope. There was something that had malicious intent. You were there, your family was there. 
and you are the only people that have been impacted by that. By the powers invested in me by the FCC and, well, because I want to, I hereby interrupt this broadcast for another ad break. <clears throat> Are you self-conscious of your hairline? Needlessly suffering from male pattern baldness? Have you tried all sorts of supplements and injections but to no avail? Then it's time to stop looking for miracle solutions. There aren't any. Join Toupee of the Month Club and watch your problems and exposed scalp disappear. Toupees often come with a negative stigma, but they don't have to. The Toupee of the Month Club has lots of fun, eye-catching colors and styles. Perfect for the man on the go. Simply send your old toupee back at the end of the month to be regroomed and recirculated once more amongst the thousands of subscribers. Easy and eco-friendly. Toupee of the Month Club. You pay us to pay you. All right, full concentration now, Terry. It's just the funny bone. Nothing you haven't tweezed before. It's all in the wrist and ooh, almost out. Oh, God. Are you kidding me? I can't even complete a routine brain freeze removal surgery anymore. Ah, oh, well, might as well watch another tape. At least I have that going for me. Here we go. It was uh, October 13th of 2010. I was in Mokur, Afghanistan near the border of Pakistan. I was in the middle of a year-long deployment during uh, what turned out to be the bloodiest year in Afghanistan for U.S. troops. I worked in small teams of six guys. Our job was to move into dangerous areas before the main force, in bed with the locals, and secure the area by uh, pushing out terrorist groups and just pretty much helping out the villagers any way we can. We lived amongst them, you know, fought with them, protected them. On this day, though, my team and I were manning an observation post overlooking three small villages, one to the east, one to the northeast, and one to the south. We were living in a hole on top of a sand dune that was about 15 foot by 15 foot and three foot deep. It was surrounded by these square HESCO baskets filled with sand that stood about three foot tall. We stacked up plywood on top to have some shade in some areas. The villages we were watching consisted of mud huts, houses made out of sand, mud, and water. The only modes of transportation were like donkeys and the occasional motorcycle. It was really a, a rural area. There wasn't much around except the villages. At that time, it had been quiet for about a week and very little had happened. The action kind of died down. When it was calm like that, I would write in my journal about things that had happened the week before or just while I was there, because I wanted to document everything I did. I did the same thing in my first deployment in Iraq. I documented things that happened so I wouldn't forget. It was about noon that day. The sun was shining bright with zero cover. You could see for miles in every direction from this observation post. I mean, it was like the horizon was the limit. You could see as far as you wanted to. We had bought a goat from one of the locals, and I was getting ready to clean and quarter it so we could eat it that day. My teammates, Chris and Ben, were sitting on top of the roof scanning the horizon while uh, Doc and Jason were talking with the locals, getting ready to prep the goat. As I exited the Hesco baskets, and from the time it took to walk from my pack to the guys, the sky went completely dark like a smart bulb when someone dims it really slowly. Like the sky just slowly went dark within a matter of about a minute. It was like being in a confined room with no light at all. I had to hold my hand literally about one to two inches from my face to see it. It was completely pitch black dark. 
I had a little bit of vertigo because it was so dark, you know, I was like, I, I couldn't really get my balance in a way. You couldn't see the sun at all, like the sun was completely gone. At first I thought it was a sandstorm because usually when a sandstorm blows in, it gets real dark, you can't see anything. But when I raised my hand to my face, I didn't feel any wind and I didn't see any sand bouncing off my hand. And so I'm sitting there and the only visible light that I could see was uh, the display on the radio down inside the HESCO baskets. I went down in the dark, grabbed my gear and put it on and I tried to locate the other guys at that point. And it's completely dark, you can't see anything. It was eerily quiet, like there was no noise. I heard Ben on the radio trying to get uh, Comanche Mike, which was like our command on the radio, trying to figure out what was going on. He couldn't raise anybody and the hand mic wasn't even keying. Usually when you use a military radio and you key the hand mic, it gives you a little bleep on the speaker to let you know that you're keyed. And that wouldn't even key, but the display was on and the frequency was right. So the radio was operational and it was working fine. It just wasn't transmitting or receiving anything. For my job in the military, which was a 19 Delta, the radio is your bread and butter is what keeps you alive. It's what calls for fire, air support, QRF. The radio is your most important weapon and every scout knows that. And so our radios were taken care of more than our weapons, more than ourselves. Our radios came priority one and our radios were always immaculate, clean, operational. I think I even like scolded Ben a little bit because he was in charge of that, maintaining them. And I was like, did you not fucking clean the outputs and stuff like that? He's like, no, I did. They're, they're perfectly fine. Then I checked them and they were. Then I walked outside and started calling for the other guys to come so I could get accountability for everybody that was there. We accounted for everybody, made sure everybody was safe, okay. We got our gear on because we didn't know what was about to happen, you know. We put our nods on, they worked. Nods are night vision goggles. We could see then, and we could obviously see there was no wind or like sand or anything being blown around. It was completely calm. It was just really dark. We kind of just walked outside the Hesco's while one guy stayed by the radio and just kind of stood there. Once we accounted for everyone, we began hearing faint popping noises overhead up in the sky. It could have been a mile up in the sky. It could have been 10 feet in the sky. I couldn't tell. It would pop in front of you, then it would pop at two o'clock, then it would pop at four o'clock, then it would pop at nine o'clock. And it was just random areas and random timing. You know, when a bullet flies over your head, you can get a, a general idea where it's coming from based on the noise and how far away it is. With these, it was like it could have been right in front of us or it could have been two miles away, I couldn't tell. I'm uh, literally standing there looking up in the sky, trying to determine which direction they're coming from, what they are, if it's a threat. Still, I'm just sitting there frozen footed, like what is this and what is it gonna do to try to kill me? A bullet would have hissed or popped or cracked. It wasn't a bullet. It, a bullet sounds completely different. It wasn't an aircraft. Aircraft don't make that noise. Helicopters don't make that noise. It sounded like an air compressor shooting small bursts of air in random directions. Like every one to three seconds, it would make this noise. I couldn't see the other guy's faces. We were just silent, like what the hell is going on? After about three or four minutes of this, my nods start to flood out, so I raise them up. See that the sun's starting to come out again, and the sun is in the sky. And we could see for miles again, and we had all our gear on, like, ready for something, and we felt kind of like idiots. We were sitting there ready to go, but then the sun came out, and nothing, there was nothing there. There was not a cloud in the sky, nothing, like, in front of the sun that could have blocked it or anything like that. There was no sandstorm. I just looked around at the guys, and I'm like, do you guys have any idea what that was? Immediately, soldiers will start making jokes about something that's unexplainable or serious or whatever. And so there were jokes being made about aliens and, and all this other stuff. I just remember being completely confused about what just happened, because I had spent a year in the desert before, and I'd been there for about seven months already, and I've witnessed every desert phenomenon, weather phenomenon that there is. 
And this was none of that. I remember asking Ben, like, what the hell was that, man? And he had no idea. We called command and the radio started working. We asked them if they could hear us on the radio before and if they experienced the same thing. They said no and asked what we were talking about. The fact that the whole sky went dark and the command didn't witness it 15 kilometers away was confusing to me too. But they had no idea about any of it and they couldn't hear us on the radio when we were trying to call them. The rest of the day, me and my team, we got the goat ready, we ate it. We just remember talking around the fire that night about, you know, what, what was that? What were those noises? The next morning, we were packing up to leave. The sun had just came up over the horizon and it was real early morning. And we were packing up to leave the OP and head back to the outpost when we received a call from uh, Comanche Mike that one of our Humvees had been hit that morning with an IED, killing the entire crew. There was three soldiers and all of them, all of them were my friends. On the way back to the outpost, it was quiet, you know, we didn't talk much. And the thoughts of what happened the day before when the sky went dark were overshadowed by the loss of three of our really close friends. When we got back to the outpost after that next morning, the section leader went and talked to platoon sergeant. We, we moved it up the chain of command and told him in detail what happened, but nobody knew anything about it. And nobody had any answers for us either. So time passed and everyone kind of forgot about the sky going dark that day. It wasn't until I'd been out of the army for a few years that I got out my old journals and read the entry about that day and that the memory came back to me. It just like infected me again, like the need to know what that was, like just, it drives me crazy. I scoured the internet for answers. I began to think that maybe I had lost it for a minute over there and wrote something crazy, like I was delirious from the heat or exhaustion or combat fatigue or something where I wrote down something in my journal that was just out there. I called Chris and I asked him if he remembered that day in detail about the sky going dark and the noises and the radio. And he said yes and confirmed that he remembers it too. He said he completely forgot about it though. Right after that, I called Ben. He confirmed it all as well, everything, every detail. I'm still looking for an answer. I don't, I don't have an answer. And, it, and, and I know some guys will, will write it off as maybe I was combat fatigue or something like that. But when it's three guys, remembering the exact same event in detail, it, it couldn't have been combat fatigue or me being delirious. It actually happened and like, I, it wasn't an eclipse. I researched that date and that location of the earth. There was no eclipse that day. I've been in, in an eclipse before too. I've seen it, a full eclipse. The most recent one, I was in Missouri and I witnessed that one. It was darker than that, much darker. In a heavy sandstorm, when it rolls in, you can literally see the wall of sand that's hundreds of feet tall coming towards you. That day though, there was no wall of sand. There was no warning. There was no anything to tell us that it was a sandstorm. Even in a heavy sandstorm, you can still see a glimmer of the sun through the sand. This day though, there was no light and there was no sun and there was nothing but darkness until we put our nods on. And even when we put our nods on, it, I mean, there was so little light that our infrared sensors couldn't pick it up. That's how little light there was, even with night vision. I think had the sky just went dark, I could write it off as some weather phenomenon, but the noises were creepy. While searching the web, I've looked at scientific reasons and I've looked at like supernatural things. One of the craziest explanations I found was that uh, we died that day and the noises were suppressed mortar rounds that we heard through our subconscious when we got blown up. That's the reason why we all four remember it. And that's the reason why there's no explanation why the command couldn't hear us or didn't know anything about it. That we were killed that day and we just don't know it. I think that odds are that what I experienced that day is 
something I don't understand. And like something I don't think anybody understands yet. I think that possibly we were a part of something that isn't documented or isn't talked about or heard of even. It's one of those things that happens to you that if you tell people, they're not gonna fully believe you. They're gonna think that you were delusional or crazy. I know what I witnessed and I know what I remember. And my buddies confirmed it that were there with me at that time. And I'm not known for fabricating things or making things up. I'm a pretty black and white guy. Like it's either this or that. And this is one of those things in my life that isn't black and white, that there's no clear answer for. At the risk of sounding nuts, I'll say that it, it might be something supernatural that we witnessed. D4. Ha, <laughs> gotcha. Oh, whoops, hello. Malachi and I have moved on to another game, and I didn't realize the time. It was so nice to have you join us today. We look forward to having you back at Radio Rental soon. Until next time, this is Terry Carnation saying, be kind and be six. <laughs> Radio Rental is created by Payne Lindsay and brought to you by Tenderfoot TV. Executive producers Payne Lindsay and Donald Albright. Hosted by Rain Wilson as his character, Terry Carnation. Produced by Payne Lindsay, Mike Rooney, and Meredith Stedman. With additional production by Eric Quintana. Written by Meredith Stedman. Additional writing by Mark Lachlan. Sound design by Cooper Skinner. Original score by Makeup and Vanity Set. Cover art by Trevor Eiler and Rob Sheridan. If you have a radio rental story that you'd like to share, please email us at yourscarystory at gmail.com or contact us via the form on our website, radiorentalusa.com. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Radio Rental. You can also follow the illustrious Terry Carnation on social media. Just search at Terry Carnation. To hear more from Terry, listen to his podcast, Dark Air. Special thanks to Grace Royer and Oren Rosenbaum at UTA, the Nord Group, Station 16, Beck Media and Marketing, and the team at Cadence 13. On behalf of the Radio Rental Store, we'd love it if you'd subscribe, rate, and review. And don't forget to share our show with a friend of the genre. Thanks for listening.